Welcome to Mastering Your Financial Life, hosted by Judy Heft, the founder and CEO of Judith Heft and Associates Financial and Lifestyle Concierge. This year, they're celebrating 26 years in business. In every episode, Judy interviews professionals who help others successfully manage their financial lives. You can find this show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Judy is the author of two books, How to Be Smart, Successful, and Organized with Your Money, for a Better Today and Tomorrow, and her latest book, Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles, How to Successfully Manage Money in Every Decade of Life. You can read chapters of her books and catch prior episodes of this show at www.juditheft.com. Now here's the host of Mastering Your Financial Life, Judy Heft. And good morning, everybody. Hi, we're here today with Phil Siegel. I'm Judy Heft, financial and lifestyle concierge, and we're celebrating 27 years in business. I'm really excited to be here and have Phil as our 46th guest on Mastering Your Financial Life. And so thank you, Phil. Phil is uh, an investigator. He's a lawyer and a financial journalist. He started out as a financial journalist. Then he decided to become a lawyer. And then he ended up doing this investigative work. And I think it all really ties together. And he's going to tell us how that happens. And he, his firm, they assist lawyers with fact finding. And he's also an author. He's the author of The Art of Fact Investigation. And he's, you know, he really has a lot of great information to share with us today. So welcome, Phil. I'm happy to have you as my guest. Thanks. It's good to be here. Thank you. So, you know, what kind of people hire you? Who needs a private investigator? And why is it different from just doing a search yourself? I'm hired by a variety of different kinds of people. Uh, women who are getting divorced sometimes hire me uh, either through their lawyer. That's what I prefer. Or sometimes directly if they think that their spouse or soon to be ex-spouse is hiding assets from them. Uh, I also get hired by regular litigators, not necessarily divorce lawyers, uh, who need to know if it's worth suing a person. If we win, can we? is there anything to collect? Or we won, now we can't find anything to get. go, go get with our judgment. Uh, sometimes I'm hired by litigators who want to know who the other person is on the other side. Who is this person suing us? Who are these witnesses we need to talk to? Uh, what's their story? Uh, any kind of, any time you can't find out enough about a person from just looking yourself on, on the internet, uh, then you would think about at least having a talk with me to see what else might be available. So what are some of the kinds of information that you can find out for somebody that, you know, we as lay people going and doing a typical Google search can't find? Because we ended up, you know, I've done it and you get a firewall there, like a paywall, I guess you call it, and you can't get through. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I really want need this, but, you know, how can you get through it? What do you do? Use? Well, a lot of times uh, what I get is something that you, as you say, could get uh, if you need to know. Uh, what companies a person has in Texas, you can go on and create an account at the Secretary of State in Texas for a dollar and start looking. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can look at property they might have in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and you can do all kinds of things online, sometimes for not very much money. Uh, the thing is that people don't know in America where the information is. There's 3,000 counties in America more uh, a lot of information is sorted by county, and you don't know exactly how many counties you need to look in. So a lot of times what I'm going to find is public information uh, that you could have found had you subscribed to Bloomberg and looked at newspapers, or had you subscribed to LexisNexis and looked at newspaper databases. A lot of times I'll say, here, here's everything we found. And I'm never asked to be a, an expert witness because everything I find is just this is information that that is admissible. It's there. It's so uh, I don't have to say uh, you know in my opinion there's this company here that's his because it's 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 his. He's the guy mm -hmm. who's behind the company over here. Or mm -hmm. I'll say to a litigator, here's a company that goes back to the address where your where your person seems to be all the time. Maybe you should you should subpoena. Think of subpoenaing that information or ask him in discovery. Can you, you know, is this your company? So a lot of times it's not that hard to go get the stuff if you do it all the time. And the mm -hmm. thing is, 
our company, that's all we do. So for us, it's quite easy. But for someone else who's not used to looking at company registries all over the United States or all over the world, it, it, there's a big learning curve. That's really the big uh, impediment. Well, it's always helpful to have a professional with whatever you do, but especially with what you're doing, you know, just down to get to the nitty gritty. And, you know, the other piece of it is time is valuable. And do you want to spend the time doing it yourself when you can hire someone who's going to do it in a third of the time or a quarter of the time and really get a more accurate, you know, information to you, you know, that it's really, it's the truth. So it's interesting. So, you know, are you invading anybody? You're not invading anybody's privacy, I guess, if it's all out there on the internet. But, you know, are there things that you can find out that the regular layperson can find out even from doing these searches? Like, Not really. Uh, I have access to a couple of databases through, uh, you know, because I, I have a law firm that, that, that I work with, my own law firm. So I can get a couple of phone phone numbers, pretty much. I don't. I cannot get bank account information. That's. I mean, there are investigators that'll go do that. That's illegal in my view. So I don't do that. I don't get phone records. I don't get medical records. But really, the key with investigation is knitting together disparate pieces of information to make a whole picture. So you see that he went bankrupt in you know 2014, and then you see that he in 2015 he bought a huge house while he was in bankruptcy. So that, that might be bankruptcy fraud. Who knows? But you're putting together you're putting together different pieces of information, organizing it, usually chronologically, because that's how life is lived. And you're and you're painting a picture of, of someone's life. The information you get about the person comes from all different places. And you'll also get it in not in the order in which it happened. You won't get the information from 2010 first, then the information from 2011. So you're, it's all coming in uh, at different times and it relates to different times in the past. And, and it's up to me to make it into a coherent possible story. Is it the 100% truth? I don't know, because sometimes you can, there are just gaps in information because I'm not allowed to get certain things. And a lot of times information about, think about yourself or anyone else listening to this, most of what we know about ourselves is not there on the internet. Uh, everywhere you've worked, everyone you've dated, uh, everyone you've had a fight with, uh, that stuff's in your head or maybe in the head of someone who knows you. So you're never going to get a 100% perfect picture of someone. Uh, I mean, after all, people who have been married to someone for 20 years can come to me and say, I have no idea where our money comes from. I have no idea how the business works. So if it's someone who's a litigation opponent, someone you maybe want to do business with and you want to make sure they're OK before you invest your five hundred thousand dollars in their restaurant, uh, how much are you going to know about them in advance? Probably not much. And you're not going to necessarily know everything about them afterwards. But you might see that, oh, they got sued by the last three partners they had or they lied to you about their background. And in fact, uh, they have never they were not involved in this other restaurant that you thought they were involved in. There's no sign of them on any kind of ownership document. You call the people who have that restaurant. They say, no, he never invested here. So you can find out a lot of helpful things without getting the complete picture. That's pretty interesting. You started out as a, a financial reporter. Is that right. I, I was a regular journalist and I got into financial journalism uh, when I was based in uh, in Asia. Uh, and then I stayed a financial journalist for almost a decade uh, in 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 Hong Kong, mostly. Uh, and I was the finance editor at the Asian Wall Street Journal. And I worked for Bloomberg and uh, the International Herald Tribune. And then I went to law school thinking I would become a better financial journalist. But I liked law school so much. I went all the way through. Uh, and then when I got out of law school, I found out that no one wanted a middle-aged first-year associate in New York City. And they were right not to want me. I wouldn't have put up with the 80-hour weeks and pay your dues, kid, because I was over 40 years old. I had a family. So I started doing investigations, which is a perfect mixture of the kind of things journalism journalists do, which is to guess a little bit where to look without the benefit of any kind of subpoena or badge or no one is required to talk to me. Uh, and then also with legal training, I can understand cases that I'm reading, uh, which a lot of journalists can't understand. 
even simple ones. You know, if, if you have six weeks of law school, the dirty secret about law school is after about six weeks, you can kind of read a case and figure out what it is you don't know and um, at least know what questions to ask about it. But if it's if you've never gone to law school, sometimes you're reading a case and it's this blizzard of Latin and you don't know what it what what it's all about. And so being able to read cases is helpful in doing background on people and also to understand what my clients need from me. What kind of proof do they need? What kind of case is it? So it's it's helpful. And then also reading financial documents is very helpful. And, and I got a very good training in that after all those years as, as a financial reporter. So we have the financial documents, we have the legal documents, we have the inquisitive nature that journalists need. And it it's a, it's a decent package when you're doing mostly financial investigations. That's great, Phil. That sounds like you really put all those wonderful skills together to start this company that you've been you've had what for twelve or fifteen years, something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's two thousand nine, right? Excellent. Yeah, you really ma married all these wonderful skills together. It's really helpful to people. Let's take a little break here, and then we're going to come back and talk a little bit more. I'm here with Phil Siegel, investigative reporter. Hey there. I just want to tell you a little bit about my new book that just came out called Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles. And here it is. It's how to successfully manage your money in every decade of life. I co-authored this with my CFO, Liz Levy. And together we created this manual that's going to help you through every stage of life. We talk about having a baby. We talk about young adulthood, pre-retirement, what to do when you're at that age of retirement, if you're contemplating divorce, do you need an estate plan? We cover all of these, each subject in a different chapter. And I really think that you're going to find this so helpful because at the end of every chapter, we have checklists that you can look at and you can use and they can be a guide for you. So this is a wonderful manual that we've created. It's available on Amazon. You can also find it on our website at judithhef.com slash book. And we're here for you. If you need anything, reach out. I hope you enjoy the book. Here's another picture of it, just so you know what's going on. Here it is. And I'm really proud of it. It's my second book. And I'd love to have you uh, read it and give me your feedback. Judy Heft, judithheft.com, financial and lifestyle concierge, celebrating 26 years in business. And over the years, I've learned so much. And what I've been trying to do is impart a little bit of this knowledge to you so I can help all of you become as financially organized as I am. And we're back. We're back with Phil Siegel, the Charles Griffin intelligence. So Phil, you know, what are some of the things that you can't find out? You can't find out something that's not written down and that no one will tell you about. And if you Google yourself, We've all done it. Let's face it. We all wonder what's out there about ourselves. You Google yourself. What percentage of what you know about yourself is there on Google? Maybe if you're a very famous person, like a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs or something like that, maybe maybe a few percent. If, you, if you're the president of the United States, more because people have written books and spent a lot of time looking into you. But for most people, it's one percent or less. And so... Uh, there are other ways to go about finding out more. As I said, you know, you can go to law, law cases, for example. Legal cases mostly are not online. You have to go to courthouses and retrieve them physically. Um, a lot of times Google is not going to index uh, every document in the world. Even if it is on the Internet, Google won't find it for you. Uh, Google, I like to think of as a as a reference librarian who tells you, look in that book over there if you want to find out how many lobsters are caught each year in the in Maine. The, the li librarian won't know that, but might say to you, go over there to the state state of Maine yearbook that we have on the shelf, and that will tell you. Or the fisheries department of you know the federal government might tell you. So uh, there are a lot of things that that you can get, but not necessarily on Google. But as I said, you I can't get bank account information legally unless you put it up somewhere unless you stick it up on a, on a, on a website to show someone. I'm not going to be able to see your bank account information, your medical information I can't get. Your, I mean, I, you, there are ways to get all this. It just isn't legal. So legally, I can't get all that, and I won't. Um, and, then, and then the things that, that you know about yourself that are not written down. If no one else is going to tell me about them, or if you've never told anyone about them, then I can't get them. 
So that can be quite a lot of things. But as I say, if a lot of things that you can get will paint enough of a picture to let you make a decision about, okay, that's a good offer. That's someone I want to continue to look at to hire. I want to continue looking to maybe invest with this person. Here are some good questions to ask this person. Hey, there's some discrepancy on your resume. You know, it looks like you actually left Bank of America six months earlier than you said you did. Is that right? What happened? And maybe the, at that point they'll say, no, that's not right. Or my resume was wrong. Or yeah, I did. there was a little job I left off the resume that didn't work out. And this happens. And it's up to you to decide what you do with that information. I don't know what you're going to do with it, what your risk tolerance is. So a lot of times there's follow-up that you need to get with the person you're looking at if that's uh if that's uh, suitable, if that's appropriate, sometimes you're looking at people and you you're not you're you don't want to, them to know you're looking and and you don't talk to them. It's up to the client really to tell me that. Mm -hmm. So lots of stuff that's illegal, and then lots of stuff that's not just not there for anyone to find. No, oh, it's encouraging, and I feel comfortable knowing that nobody's going to be able to get my bank or my medical information. Not that I have anything to hide, but still. Well, they can get it. They can pretend to be you. Oh, well, that. Uh, they can get your date of birth. They can get your social security number. Yeah. If you post your birthday on Facebook and you write, a, write in general what your mother's maiden name is and you write a bunch of stuff, people can guess and you have a really bad password. That's the same password that's been hacked at other places if you if you have the same password on all your sites someone might be able to hack in so you should always have different passwords for each thing that's right and or right. use a password keeper that makes up what i call those gobbledygook passwords that nobody's ever going to remember like that's right that's what i use in fact yeah. i don't even know my bank password i don't know what it is i don't know any passwords i really don't but and you know um i forgot i was going to say something about that too about i don't remember Anyway, I was going to say something about passwords and security and everything like that, but I don't remember what it was. But this was really helpful and interesting. So, I mean, like, I guess, you know, one of the things you said is you won't do anything illegal, which is really encouraging and good to know. And so I guess that would be part of my question that I was going to ask you. How do you know a good investigator from a bad one? And I guess you need to, how do you find out if they're going to do anything illegal? Like, for instance, for me, I wouldn't feel comfortable hiring someone. And if there's information that they can't get, would they try to get it illegally? Would they let me know that they're doing it illegally or they wouldn't tell me how does that all work? Well, for bank account, it's one, one thing you can say to any investigator is, can you get me bank account information? Mm -hmm. And if they say, sure, don't, don't use them. If you say, can you get, I need medical records. Can you get me medical records? They say, oh yeah, no problem. Don't use them. Uh, if you say, sometimes they'll try and tell you that it is legal to do, to get medical records and you can, you can get bank records and in certain, and we have a special database and we're a member of the SWIFT network. I wrote a whole law journal article about this because I went in and posed as a customer and asked a bunch of these providers, is it legal to get these bank accounts? And this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they told me, the justifications they gave me were laughable. And I did an article about all the things that some of these vendors told me justified what they did. It's not it's not legal. In fact, it's it's not only against federal law, but here in New York, where I am, it's against New York state banking law. So really, though, you can ask some of those questions. The other thing you can say to people is, uh, and how much would it cost to do a national criminal background check? And if they tell you 50 bucks, then you don't use them because to get to do a proper criminal check just for the, for New York State, New York State Office of Criminal uh, Office of Court Administration, ninety eight dollars. So a, a national check for fifty dollars is impossible. There is no non law enforcement national criminal background check. It doesn't exist. So if you add, and but you see all that stuff on the web, thirty nine dollars, sixty nine dollars. It's garbage. And so if, if they tell you that they're going to use that, then don't use that. And also your investigator ought to be able to tell you how he or she is doing everything. If they say, well, I can't tell you how I got that, but I got that. No good. I tell people which databases I use. You know, you can get you can get it yourself or, you, you know, if you have a law license, you can subscribe to it. I don't have anything that my legal clients don't have. There's no special secret database out there. And if a, an investigator is trying to tell you they have secret weapons, they can't tell you what they are, I would stay clear. 
Well, that's good information. That's really helpful. And the thing I was thinking about before was when we were talking about the bank questions. So, you know, they ask you your mother's maiden name and what street did you grow up on your first school, et cetera. I always make up answers to those questions because everybody's going to be able to find out your mother's maiden name or what school you went to or if you lived on a certain street. So it's really, I just make up silly words and I write them down, of course, and I yeah. have them in my password protector. So I have them only I can find them because I don't remember them. They're different every time. But that's one of the ways that I get around that. And I think maybe it prevents a little bit from hacking. That, that's so, smart. That's yeah, smart. Just, you know, just make up any old word. So this was really helpful. So is there, uh, you know, I think, how can people find you? You know, where do they get to you? What if they need you? Uh, Charles Griffin LLC.com is our website. And on there, there's a contact form. There's a phone number. Uh, we don't charge to consult if you want to call or write and say, what what could you do? How much might it cost? Uh, I'll tell you, we have sample cases up on the website with the prices people paid. So you can see we did this, we did this, and the bill was this much. And so you have an idea of what the value is going to be. A lot of investigators won't talk price. Uh, I don't mind doing that. I think it's, it's a business like anything else. You want to know how much might it cost if I wanted to do an asset search on my husband. So uh, lots of information there. We have two blogs. One's called The Divorce Asset Hunter. One's called The Ethical Investigator. All the articles uh, that have been written by, by me and others in the firm uh, are there, as well as, uh, as well as television appearances and links to podcasts and things like that. So that's all there. And they can write, they can call um, and read. Uh, and um, I'd welcome that. And I'm sure they can find you on LinkedIn, too. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, do an active amount of uh, the blog. Anytime I put something up on the blog, I, I also go on LinkedIn and link to that. And I sometimes write little things on LinkedIn that are not from the blog. But I, I try and write the blog. Come One of the blogs has a new entry every month and I'm, I'm on LinkedIn pretty actively. That's great, Phil. Well, it was really fun talking to you this morning. You. I think I hope fun. our listeners learned a lot. I know I did. And it's always great to have worked with you and to, you know, see how you do business. And I love the fact that you're so ethical about everything, which is really interesting. It was good to let us know and let our listeners know that not everybody's honest and above board and how to maybe spot some of the red flags. So thank you for that. Thank you. You've been listening to Mastering Your Financial Life, hosted by Judy Heft. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and sharing this show with others. You can read chapters of Judy's books and catch prior episodes of Mastering Your Financial Life at www.judithheft.com.